What's up everybody, welcome back to another video. Today we're gonna to be doing part three of the LBO case study for Project Christmas. And if you guys haven't watched part one and part two, I've linked that in the description below. So please check those out first before you watch this because it sort of like builds on top of one another. But with that said, let's just sort of hop in. So basically in part one, what we did was that we sort of laid out the transaction assumptions, your leverage assumptions, your sources and uses. And then in part two, which is the longer video, we've sort of built out the PL forecast and also the balance sheet, cash flow statement, debt schedule, and ultimately linked them up together. And here what we're going to do in part three is we're basically going to build out the returns calculation to ultimately see if this investment is good or bad. And how can you optimize sort of your entry and exit multiple to get the best return possible? So with that said, let's begin. So you're gonna copy the format from above and you're gonna name this returns calculation. And then this is gonna be your total equity value received at exit. So you're basically gonna, let's title that and set it up. You're gonna start out with your exit EBITDA because you wanna calculate your TEV first. So you're gonna times your exit multiple. Total TEV at exit, TEV at exit. And then you're going to reverse that TEV to equity value. So you're going to less your debt and you're going to add your cash and then you get your equity value at exits. So for your exit EBITDA, you're going to come to 2022 and you're going to link this above to our P&L. So link that to the 22.3, drag it across your exit multiple. It's already given to you the transaction assumptions we listed here. So it's basically assuming null expansion or contraction in your exit multiple compared to your entry, which is, I guess, reasonably conservative. I think most of the time multiples actually contract unless you're in some industry that's very fast growing, but it's really dependent on macroeconomic conditions as well as the quality of the business when you exit it. So you're going to multiply it, you're going to get your TEV at exit. And then afterwards, you're going to sum up your debt for your balance sheet. So you're going to sum up your, where is it? Your term loan, your senior note, and your pick debt. There's no revolver here because we're not really drawing. You're going to make this figure negative, drag it across. And then you're also going to sum up and add in your cash. So you're going to take out debt and add in your cash. So it'll be sum, oops. So look at three figures here. So you, in 2026, your the exit your equity value the equity value of your company is going to be worth 308 million dollars. But then keep in mind that this 308 isn't going to the sponsor directly because you do have sort of another party that owns a portion of the company, which is the management who rolled over from the previous transaction. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a second section to split that equity value based on a portion of ownership, based on a proportion of ownership between you and management or old management. So it's going to be proceeds available for pro rata distribution. You're going to have your percentage sponsor ownership, percentage management rollover. And you're going to have your proceeds to sponsor, proceeds to management. Or rolled over management. I'm not sure if that's the correct term, but it's whatever. Bold these two. And this is essentially your answer, basically. So for your sponsor ownership, what you're going to do is you're going to go to your sources and uses. It's going to be equals. Oh, I can't find it. Okay, equals your sponsor equity injection, which is the amount of money you put in over the sum of the sponsor equity injection, as well as the amount that management rolled over. <coughs> so effectively, you own 81% of the business. So you're going to anchor this, drag it across. Oops. And then your management rollover is going to be the inverse of that. So 1 minus 81.5, which gives you 18.5. Now you can calculate your proceeds. So it's going to be your 81.5 times your equity value at exit. You're going to anchor that and drag it across. So essentially, at the, your exit year, you're going to be getting back $251 million from your investment. And now we're going to calculate our MOIC and our IRR. Also make this green. No, let's not make this green. 
looks like it's blue. Because this is theoretically your answer. And before we do that, we're going to create an MIC and IRR calculation table. So this is going to be our 2026 returns calculation. I'm getting really fat fingers today, and it's fucking, my, fucking up my ability to type. Basically, here you're going to have your 2021. Let's make this into a date. So, month, month, you're going to be MM dash DD for day dash year, year, year for four. Oops. I mean, yeah. But here you're going to be doing EO month. It's going to be your formula 12 to give you next year. Copy the format over, and then you end at 2026. So for your initial investment, you're going to do equals negative the amount that your you inject into the company. So your sponsor injection is going to be $98 million. So you originally invested $98 million in the business, and you got back $251 million. So that said, let's go ahead and calculate our MOIC. So it's going to be your 251 divided by negative you put a negative sign to make it positive. But basically, you made 2.6 times your money on this investment. We're going to come up here take this number format. And based on this, I think the IRR is going to be, what, like 21%? Yeah, somewhere around that area. Probably 21 or 20? 20.7. Uh, yeah, so 21% basically. And the way I deducted that so quickly is that the rule of thumb is that if you've, if it's a five-year hold period, whatever your MOIC is, if it's below, I think, 4.5, a quick approximate measure you could do is just sort of take this 2.6 figure and move it one decimal to the right. You get 26, and you're going to subtract 5, and it's basically going to give you 21, and that's going to be pretty close to whatever your return is. So that's basically the rule of thumb. So if you're doing a paper LBO and someone goes, okay, you make 2.6 times MOIC, What's your IRR uh, in five years? You're just going to be like, okay, 2.6, that's 26, minus 1. No, sorry, minus 5, that's 21, 21% IRR. And boom, it's pretty close, 20.7. Here you have your sensitivity tables. And it's going to be a last piece that I leave you guys with. So it's going to be MIC. Drag it over to column I. Facebook popping off. Oh my god, Facebook really be popping off right now. I'm a messenger guy. I'm actually so slow today. I see you have your entry multiple. You have your exit multiple. Center account selection on this as well, just to make it look a little bit presentable. So for your exit multiple, let's say you just want to find like a nice midpoint. We're going to do six numbers. So exiting at 11, so let's just do 9, right? Plus 1. So this is going to be your range, your multiple range. Take the number format here. And here you're going to be equals transpose. Transpose basically takes your horizontal figures and relayers it vertically. Copy, paste as values. And then here, you're going to link it to your MOIC. And then you want to make it white so no one can see it, so it looks clean. But it's still there. The font's just white, which blends in with the white background. And now you're going to do Alt-A-W-T to open up your data table. You're going to come up here, your row input is your exit value, and your co column input is your entry multiple. You click OK. And then boom. Throw some borders up in here. Oops. So basically, what this is saying is that if you enter in a lower multiple, basically if you pay less, your returns are going to be higher. If you pay more, your returns are going to be lower. But if you pay a lot and you exit at a lower multiple, there's multiple contraction your multiple is going to be absolutely horrendous, right? But if you pay very little and then you exit at multiple contra uh, multiple expansion, like let's say you enter at 9, exit at 14, your returns are going to be insane. So with that said, let's build out the IRR now. So you're going to copy that, paste it down, change the title of the IRR, delete this out, relink this to this IRR figure right here. 
alt the awt again row input is your exit column input is your entry okay let's take the number format and boom there you have it if you exit a not if you enter a 9x which is to the ideal scenario because you want to pay as little as possible and you exit at let's say 14 your IR is going to be 38 percent year over year for the next five years of investment if it's the opposite you're going to make six percent and the question is is this a good or bad investment right i think most funds have a threshold of 2x moic over the course of let's say five to seven years and targeting like a 15 percent return threshold unless you're like a top that style fund which targets higher so i do think that this is like a good stable investment right because at the end of the day like even if multiple contracts you're not going to make a lot of money um so but you're not going to lose a lot and it seems like there's a lot more upside to this investment than there is downside it just depends on the price that you enter at right because a lot of private equity firms right when they're in a bidding process for an asset that's hot they're gonna be like okay like you know based on these sort of metrics right and the quality of your business we're going to pay you this multiple for your EBITDA and then you know like sometimes like the guy's gonna be like fuck off right like that's too low and it's all about just making the returns work right so if you do think that you can enter at 11 and exit at 11 and make your IR 20 percent, that's a great investment right because it hits your or ideally it hits your return threshold but if they're like no nah, like 11 is too low for us or right? we we'll ideally want you to pay 14x right but then in your head or based on your assumptions you think that this business ultimately is going to exit at 11x right so if you enter at 14 and you exit at 11 your ir is going to be 11 percent, which isn't worth the investment so you're ultimately going to pass on the opportunity or you're going to submit a bid that's too low and you get kicked out so yeah basically summary this is going to be the lbo case study that's built from scratch with project christmas this was a case study that i've received during my recruiting process for like a middle slash upper middle market private equity fund with a sizable sort of latest fund size. Um, yeah, uh, thanks a lot for watching guys. And before I end this video, I just wanted to say that when you're prepping for your private equity recruiting process, something that's very important to do is ultimately just doing like, keep doing different repetitions of building these models from scratch. Uh, because the more you build it, the more it becomes muscle memory and the less time you're spending, like let's say you get like a case study and there's a lot of different variables on it. Like you don't want to waste time, like waste five or 10 minutes of like the 1.5 hours that they give you to sort of like orient yourself like, oh, this is this, this is this. You want to hop straight in, start building out the template, like similar to what I did here and just sort of just plug in different variables because that's ultimately going to save you a lot of time and sort of at the end like it's going to give you back some time so you can like sort of format numbers i'm not going to do it here there's some things that are formatted off but you know it gives you a chance to go back check your work and sort of just make everything look a little bit nicer so i think that's just my tip for you guys when it comes to lb modeling tests a lot of the tests are going to be very similar to each other right like this is probably one of the more difficult ones because just given the sheer amount of variables and here like your asset write-ups you're not going to see that a lot based on my experience but yeah, it's just practice makes perfect. Do the hardest ones. And then once you master the hard ones, the easy ones just are going to be a breeze for you guys. So with that said, thank you a lot for watching this video and this three-part series again. Happy New Year's to all of you guys. And best of luck with your banking jobs going forward or your recruiting or whatever your New Year's resolution is going to be. Um, yeah, and I'll see you in the next video. So if you guys liked it, please drop a like and subscribe below to really help we grow this community. So thank you. Bow! Yeah, this shit does not work.